Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It is an S5 katana and a crane theme from Cloudhammer Steelworks, formerly known as Visor. This example is about $700, and nearest I can tell, Cloudhammer Steelworks doesn't make specific models. They have kind of small batches of things, and they're sold at RBA Katana inside the US. I'll link them in the description down below. Uh, some time ago, I did review a Visor S7 Katana. They again changed their name to Cloudhammer Steelworks. At the time, it held up really well. S5 is supposed to be more durable, but frankly, I can't tell you what sort of steel this is made out of or not. Uh, I'm also not going to push this one to failure. This is an example that I don't get to keep. It was sent to me for review. I didn't have to pay anything for it, but I do have to send it off to either another reviewer or John. I did put it through its paces, though, and I can comment a little bit on some of the debatably abusive things I did with it. Uh, anyway, do know as well that I study Japanese swordsmanship. I'm not an expert, and I'm also reviewing this in a slightly diminished condition. Uh, I've got some elbow trouble going on, and so as I'm cutting and moving around, bear in mind, not only am I a novice, but I'm also, <laughs> I'm also a little injured. So keep all that context in mind as you hear my babbles. The purpose of this review is to help you determine if it's worth your hard-earned money or not, and $700 is not an inexpensive sword by any means. Now, it's a little more expensive than the $530 S7 sword that I reviewed some time ago, and honestly, I don't know if I'm going to answer if it's more durable. I didn't push this one to failure, but I did do some debatably abusive things. You'll get to see that a little bit later in the review. Anyway, I'll do some close-up video, I'll move it around and do EI with it, and then I'll cut with it, and you'll see all that. Hopefully, it helps you make up your mind. All right, I'm going to start with the kasha, the pommel, the end cap, the little bit down here. And I want to comment first on the fact that I really have some mixed feelings about it. And most of it is cosmetic related. I don't tend to like this uh, painted silver gold look. It has a, I think it's a poor imitation of the thing that it's trying to replicate from the Japanese aesthetic or Japanese style fittings. I generally prefer well cast things that don't have this kind of embellished silver gold paint on it. That's just my, my preference. Uh, this particular set of fittings, just to call it out, has mediocre casting. It's not the worst, but it's it's far from the best, and it could be a little crisper, a little cleaner. I do think that the paint is tastefully applied, though. I have seen it gobbed on and look more childish and crude than it does on here. Overall, I think the fitting set aesthetically, well, it's not to my taste because of the kind of silver and gold and the, uh, the just general crudeness that comes with that in the application of the silver paint. I still think it's overall a reasonable example of these things. Very often the, the the casting quality is worse and very often the silver or gold application of paint or whatever uh, etching or enamel or whatever they're putting on there to, to leave the silver, I believe it's some sort of paint, is, is worse, <laughs> frankly, more poorly applied. So this isn't bad, but it's it's just not to my taste. From the other perspectives of it, the, the crane theme does flow throughout the sword. I happen to like that. I'd like it more if it were just in, in black though and didn't have the silver and gold kind of paint adornment. Uh, the rest of it, though, from a transition standpoint, I do feel a slight ledge. It's an opportunity for Visor to improve on this. I've noticed this on the other examples that are sent. It seems to be something a little bit more common. There's a slight ledge. It's minor. It doesn't catch on my hand when I use the sword, but it could, and eventually it may degrade, or the fat of my hand may rip the kasha off quicker than it would otherwise. So I would like to see it improved if it could be done in a cost-effective way, but it is it is a, a ledge that's there. There's no sharp hot spots or anything really terribly problematic though. Just a slight transition that I can I can feel, and it's on the grand scale pretty minor. There's not a giant ledge. It's not even a millimeter, but I do feel it. It is there. The kasha as well isn't glued on, which isn't necessarily bad. It's not necessarily supposed to be, uh, but I can kind of pull it and wiggle it. It gives me the sense that over time, if my hand catches on this and I use this for a really long uh, period of time, that this kasha may I may need to slide a uh, dab a super, super glue up there um, as the, the leather that holds this down loosens. Anyway, uh, apart from the transition, the kasha, and my <laughs> subjective take on the aesthetics of it, uh, it's overall functional and good, and using it, I didn't notice any problems, any hot spots. Uh, this one does have a slight ledge on it. I don't mind them being a little bit more round. This kind of pushes into the fat of my hand, but not in a way that's that's terribly uncomfortable. I'm used to it. Just bear in mind that if you get this shape, uh, you do you do feel it if you tend to hold a little further down on the on the handle. And this one has a little bit smaller handle, so that tends to be where my hands go. Anyway, it's it's worth saying overall. Uh, I think it's it's perfectly acceptable for a sword in the $700 price category, but there's opportunity for improvement. I'm going to move on to the, the handle, the, or rather the ito, the wrap, the, the shaft of the handle, if you will. Now, it's wrapped in this blue leather, and it feels a bit like jacket leather, and I, 
I really like it. This is something that's unique to Cloud Hammer Steelworks. I don't see it on other swords, other manufacturers, and they tie it well. This feels pretty tight. I can I can push it and it moves just a little bit at its places, but uh, I think that's more of the material, the leather, just having a little bit of give to it because the diamonds themselves don't move around. Underneath that, as I push, the, the whole kind of knot doesn't move. It really just moves slightly on the raised section that's folded over. Anyway, it feels kind of like the leather recliner of Ito. <laughs> if I move it around in my hand, it has a supple but easy to, to grip feel to it. It doesn't feel like it's gonna come out of my hands or anything like that. I feel like I'm in control, but it's just, it's supple and it's a comfortable sword to move around if you're doing EI and you're holding it for a long period of time. It also seems to hold up reasonably well. I haven't found it to degrade, though admittedly I haven't used one of these for years in practice. I've only had them for a period of months. Over that time though, it's, it's held up well. Um, I haven't had to clean it, so I don't know how well it holds up in that regard, but it is a very comfortable, very nice feeling feeling material to, to use and something unique to Cloudhammer Steelworks. This one is in a kind of dark blue. I like the execution here. I like the black. I like the blue. I like the color selection that they have here. I think they're nice. Uh, the diamonds do wander a little bit, not a huge amount, but they wander ever so slightly. I would call it acceptable for swords in this price point. The Minuki are an aesthetic thing as well. I like that they're a little shallower. They're not super bulbous, but they do draw my eye. So if I if I pull the sword apart and set it off to the side and just look at it, my eye tends to gravitate towards the Minuki. They're a little bit of an intense silver, and the way they catch the light is, is what pulls my eye, and that's an aesthetic thing that I'm, I'm not a huge fan of. But again, purely subjective. I do notice as well what appear to be um, the, the panels here. So underneath this handle, there are Samigawa panels, I'm guessing, and I can kind of make out where they are resting. They don't appear to be laid in. It could be the Hishigami, but either way, there's it's a little bit bulbous around where the knots form, and I believe it's because it's where the Samigawa panel is, is resting. Incidentally, the Samigawa panel also appears to be real, but very small nodule stuff. And for $700, I think there's opportunity to put something just a little bit nicer in there. It doesn't have to be have an emperor node or be a particularly great skin, uh, but this is all very, very small stuff, and I see that on two $300 swords. So on a $700 sword, there's an opportunity to at least take a, a marginally better skin with marginally better uh, nodule sizes on it. That said, it's real. It doesn't look bad. It's clean and well done. Uh, there's one peg in here, and I like that it appears to be like a... a some sort of resin or delrin or some, something that isn't made of a chopstick. Uh, if there's one peg in here, it should be pretty pretty solid stuff, and that appears to be the case here. I really like that they put in some sort of durable. Uh, durable. It also happens to look good, and if you pound it out and try to take the handle off, uh, it doesn't come apart and stuff like that. So I, I like the application here. They've also rounded the edges slightly just on the Makugi. It's one of those little nuances that if, if you're paying attention and <laughs> to little things like the peg that holds this sword together where a lot of people overlook it. It gives me confidence that you're paying attention to a lot, a lot of other small details. Anyway, as we move up to the transition around the Fuchi up here, this collar up here, again, there's slight ledges similar to the where, where they are on the Fuchi down here. Uh, it could be better. Nothing that grabs my hand, nothing that hurts, but just opportunity for improvement. There's about a millimeter uh, of, of ledge in some spots, and I think it's an opportunity to, to not have that, especially in a $700 sword. It's not to say that other swords that cost twice as much don't have similar problems, but it's certainly an opportunity. Hopefully, hopefully it's something that can be done in a cost-effective way, but it would nice the handle up that much more if, if there weren't those kind of visual transitions and the Ito lined up perfectly with the uh, Fuchi and Kashra. Uh, the rest of it though, where the Suba lines up, the transitions here, overall I think they look pretty good. The Suba as well, I've made my critiques about the overall aesthetics. It also has like what looks like bending to it. It doesn't look perfectly cylindrical. <laughs> it doesn't look like it's perfectly formed. It looks like it was cast from a bent Suba or maybe it got damaged in shipping, but I don't think so. The shipping was pretty secure and I haven't dropped it, but it looks like it's tipped over on its side just a little bit. Though I think that's the uh, the shape of the, the Suba. If you're going to cast the Suba as well, I like that this has a, a raised rim. I think there could be a little bit more dimension to it though. That said, purely aesthetic gripes. As I hold it, nothing bites in my hands, nothing's uncomfortable. From a practitioner standpoint, it's perfectly functional. And if you happen to like the way it looks, then it certainly does the job of being a Suba and having some, some nice little details in it. If I move on to the Saya, I haven't undone the 
the presentation not here. I like the side has this kind of metallic speckle sparkliness to it where if you look at it real close or it catches the light it has a little bit of zazz to it but it's not so bold that it looks strange if you're bringing it into a dojo and practicing with it. The tension on it was a little bit tight so the habaki grabs and it you know I have to be pretty pretty hard to push it in all the way. That's going to loosen up though with time. It's not not really a huge problem. As you use the sword over time, it will gradually degrade and, and feel a little bit better. And then as you use it more, you'll have to shim it. And that's just kind of par for the course. But I'd rather it come too tight than too loose. Uh, tight requires a little bit of file work or just a little bit of usage to, to, to make it fit, uh, you know, perfect, perfect. If it was too loose, then having to shim it and stuff like that, I find to be a more arduous task. So um, anyway, a little bit of file work would, would get that, but honestly, I didn't find it to be so tight that I couldn't use it. I just kind of left it uh, stick out just a millimeter or so, and, and I thought that was, that was fine. It, it, was, it was a fine thing to use for EI. It doesn't rattle. If I shake it any direction, it's, it's overall pretty stable in there, so it's not rattling around in the scabbard. And as I draw it and sheathe it, I didn't notice that it caught or was particularly bad. It's a little bit raspy in some spots, but uh, it didn't rattle around. Sometimes they're much more open in the scabbard, and <laughs> it allows you to, if you're not if you're not practicing and, and keeping the sword very still, it can catch on certain areas in the scabbard. I didn't find that to be the case. As a practitioner's tool, it was actually pretty fun to use, and overall, it's reasonably handsome. Uh, the Shitadome don't appear to be glued in, so if I untied this presentation knot, then those little washers would likely come out. I would I would like them to not be there or be secured. Personal thing in the presentation knot, though, they look pretty nice. It's also worth noting that the segeo that comes with it appears to be of a reasonable quality. Sometimes they come with little shoe spring, string garbage segeo, and, and Cloudhammer seems to be putting on some, some nicer segeo here. They did in the previous examples as well, but this is... I think a, a nicer Sageo, and thematically, it works well. It pulls my eye to the Manuki a little bit, but apart from that, I think it's a very handsome sword. Uh, if I move on to the blade, or rather the Habaki, I should say. A very simple Habaki here. There's nothing really to write home about. It's a simple brass Habaki. Does the job, though. Not much more than that that I can comment on, other than it doesn't overlap. It doesn't appear to be lopsided. There's no... Uh, wild problems. If anything, it's a bit tight. It seems to rest right on the blade itself, but it does the job. It's it's fine, and I do know that Cloudhammer Steelworks can do some more elaborate habaki stuff. There's a wave theme example that I've I've got on another sword, and I happen to like that a little bit more. This is very plain Jane, but if you're if you don't have hundreds of swords, <laughs> then uh, then it it probably won't be it won't rub you the wrong way the same way it does me. I see this simple brass habaki on most swords. It's kind of the default. So I always like it when there's some additional adornment, something that's a little bit more bespoke to the vendor to to show some some differentiation here. That said, I don't think most people care. It does the job and it's it's perfectly fine, but it's an opportunity to do something just a little bit different. Anyway, the blade. Um, this one, if I look down some of the planes, I can make out some rippling, particularly on the spine. Uh, the surface of the steel is overall pretty clean. There's not a lot of ripples there, but in the spine I can make out kind of two distinct areas where it looks like maybe they switched hands grinding or something like that. Uh, this blade as well doesn't have as much taper, profile taper here. It stays pretty wide out to the edge. It does have some measurements below. It's got distal taper, it's got profile taper. Those those are there, but it doesn't look like it does in the hand. You, do, you look at the sword and it doesn't look like it has any taper. And frankly, uh, it doesn't feel like it as as much either, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. The the blade itself is really pretty straightforward. There's not a hamon, it's a through-hardened mono steel blade, as in it's made of S5. There's no patterning on the surface. There's just reasonably clean grind lines. Uh, a yakote that's put in up here so I can, I can make out the kasaki, and that's really about it. There's not really a whole lot to say. It's done in a mirror polish, and it's done reasonably well. Uh, but I can make up tool markings, imperfections, things like that. It's not the best polish, but it, it's not really made to be. It's polished to be a mirror and sufficient, and it came reasonably sharp as well, which is also something to note that it, it came sufficiently sharp to do Tamashigiri. It could be a little bit sharper, but it came with a, a nice, good, keen edge on it, and it held up reasonably well. But I'll, I'll talk about that in cutting. Uh, from the perspective of usage, as I've mentioned a few times, I've used it for EI. It was overall very comfortable to do that. 
it's a stout sword though. So this is not a particularly long sword. It has a, a relatively nice, you know, compact handle. It's 27 and a half inches long. It's not particularly big and it's not particularly heavy either. So the weight on the sword is two pounds, four ounces, which in my mind, like two pounds, eight ounces is like the, the medium threshold. Two pounds, four is like medium, medium light, kind of somewhere in there. But it has a point of balance that's a little bit further up on the blade and that makes it feel really authoritative in the, in the cut. Moving it around, it basically feels like a stouter sword than it is. It feels heavier in the hand than you'd expect it to, given the weight and the, you know, the proportions of the sword. I thought it would be a little bit more nimble. It could be my injury, but um, at the same time, it feels like a, a stouter chopper sword, even though it doesn't have the, uh, the mass to really back it up. Uh, it's not to say that it's clumsy in the hand, though, either, but it's nearing that, I would say. It feels chunkier in the hand than I, I would have thought it would. Um, not in a bad way, but kind of pushing <laughs> pushing towards that direction where I wouldn't want it to feel much stouter in the hand than this. Uh, but I did find that I could still control the tip, I could still throw it out there, I could still generate speed. And so from a user perspective, it, it has a stouter, uh, it's a stouter blade as a training partner, but not so much that it's it's bad. Some of what I'm saying about the balance may make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up because I'm saying it's, you know, kind of getting toward the heavy side and oftentimes that uh, that gives the impression that it's clunky or dumb, and it's just trade-offs, honestly. Uh, so this sword wants to do some of the cutting for you, and while I'm moving it around and doing EI, I do see that it feels a little stouter in my hand, which is less ideal if you're doing thousands of repetitions, frankly. But when I go to cut something, it wants to help me out a little bit, which is also uncommon for a sword in this weight. A lot of times lighter swords or medium swords, like I'm really using my own mass to cut rather than the sword giving me giving my, me much assistance. And here, the sword wants to help me out. So uh, there's pros and cons. If you're doing Tamashigiri, then this still has a nice uh, wider profile to do it. It has some mass and it wants to, wants to help you out in the cut. And so that's, I think, a pro if you're doing that kind of cutting. If you're doing EI, then it's it's a little more mass than I would like for just an EI tough. But uh, for a cutting sword, it, it's perfectly fine for doing that, and it was it was fun to cut with. So when I talk about cutting, I, I did some really basic stuff. I cut pool noodles and things like that, and it's got an edge sufficient to kind of pop the pool noodles apart. So good on visor for sending it out with a good clean edge. I also then took it, which as a side note, the edge it could even be sharper, but it was sufficient to pop pool noodles apart. So I'll call that I'll call that good. I, I would still say it could be even a little bit keener. But uh, when I went out and did some more abusive stuff, water bottles, things like that, it would cut those apart without too much issue. It was when I brought it to sticks. And bear in mind that I'm starting to cut these in winter. So the sticks are frozen, they were wet. And so now they're, they're a little bit like a, a popsicle stick. <laughs> no, not quite there. They're, they're wet wood that's been frozen, so they're harder to cut than, than you might think they would be. Uh, it did really well. It, it cut into them, it bit into them, it, it cut the soil, it, it cut pretty well, and the mass also helped break it apart. So it's a little bit wider. I would find that it would cut into the stick. Sometimes it would shear right through and give really clean cuts. Other times it would push it apart and the stick would, would pop. And I didn't find any issues uh, with the sword after doing that. So no deflection, no edge rolls, no bending. I also smacked it on the side of my stand. Not a lot, not like a full on hard smack, but it's been enough to bend other through hardened swords and this one just sprang right back to shape. So there, there's no issues, no bending, no twisting, no, no issues to speak of uh, from what I put it through. And what I did was cut things that were maybe about two inches in diameter, but they were wet and frozen and that's not a kind target, I would, I would debate. <laughs> I, I would argue that that's debatably abusive. Should it survive it? Yes, but I wouldn't have been surprised if it took a slight set. I wouldn't have been surprised if the edge deflected a little bit, uh, either on the, the top of water bottle caps or on uh, on, the sore, on the on some of the targets that I was cutting. But also to smack it in the side of the stand and have it spring right back without bending, that's that's also pretty impressive and a testament to how durable the, the steel is going to be. Now, unfortunately, that's as far as I took it. Uh, so I don't know how well it's going to hold up on the croquet stick of doom. I don't know how well it's going to go to being thrown at a tree. This one still has to stay in good shape, and that's about as far as I was comfortable pushing it. As it is, though, no damage, and that's that shows generally a good build quality. Uh, I would argue that things could be just a little bit sharper, but it didn't lose edge, nearest I can tell, on cutting anything that I that I was cutting. And like I said, I, I cut frozen logs or frozen branches and uh, water bottles and the like, and gave it a little smack. It wouldn't have surprised me if it dulled slightly, but overall it feels pretty consistent along the edge. 
I'll just argue that it could have been could have been a little bit sharper. All right, short friends, I've taken you on a visual tour. I've talked about doing Iaido with it. I've talked about cutting with it. Hopefully that's enough information for you to make up your own mind about if it's worth it or not. For me personally, I still recommend it. At $700, I would say that frankly, the $530 S7 Katana is probably a better value and where I would recommend you go. But if those aren't available, then this $700 short is worth your consideration. It shows some improvement over the $530 in assembly and build quality, but I don't know if it's that enough to really justify the price difference. Um, as well as the S7, I didn't get a chance to push the S5 sword here to the same level that I did the S7, but I did push it, and I've seen other swords, through hardened swords, nice swords, bend and diminish, doing the same types of tests that I did with this one. So it seems a durable product. It seems like it really favors and puts a lot of its stock, a lot of its value for what you're paying for in that durability. And if those are things you value, which I know a number of you do, frankly, a lot of people want a sword that is going to be great for the zombie apocalypse, but that they can also do EI with and looks pretty on a wall. And I think this does that. A lot of people are going to find it compelling. And I think it's it's certainly something that I could recommend because it does seem to be a durable and well-made sword. On the flip side, if durability isn't the only thing you value in a Japanese style sword, then I think there are other swords that your dollar might go further. The polish and steel, while they might be very durable, they're not really remarkable to look at, and the fitment, frankly, could be better. There's some opportunity to improvement for improvement, and there are other companies at the same price, like Huawei, that I think do a better job if that's something you value. If you're doing EI, you want to look at a Hamon, you want some character in the steel, Huawei offers a really compelling sword. Granted, they have a long backlog, but I think you, you do get a lot for your money there. Um, Zisei is another one, a little bit more expensive, uh, very, very pretty to look at, and the fitment or the assembly was a little bit better. At the same time, if I compare a $900 Zisei sword to this sword, well, the Zisei bent on a bad cut on a tatami mat. This one took a 250 pound guy slapping it into the side of a six by six stand and it sprang back into shape. Uh, they're almost the antithesis. Antithesis. The Zisei is, uh, favors the aesthetics and looks uh, quite a bit more, but they're a little bit more fragile. This puts a lot more stock in the durability, and you certainly get that out of it. So I, I do think it offers a compelling value proposition for people. I would still say that the less expensive S7 did the same thing at a cheaper price, so I'd, I'd probably direct you there, but I still think this is a really good sword. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I don't hesitate in recommending it. Hopefully, that is, is helpful to you. <laughs> helpful to know. Uh, anyway, I, I want to call it here. I put links and all that kind of stuff in the description down below. I want to offer a special thanks to John at RVA Katana uh, for sending these swords my way to review. I have more reviews for Cloud Hammer Steelworks stuff in the works. There are a few other samples that were sent. One of them I get to push to failure, so you'll see that eventually when my elbow heals up a little bit. Anyway, uh, that's all I've got. Cheers, and thanks for watching.